everybody. Thanks for joining me. I'm really excited for today's show because I'm joined by Dan Kaplinger. Uh, Dan, if you don't know, uh, we used to do a lot of content together on Full, Motley Fool Live. Uh, we had a show in 2021 that we did every couple of weeks called the SPAC show because there were so many of these blank check companies going public. They were taking some decent companies public, some not so decent companies public. Um, the last time we did an episode, this is when we should have called the top. The, while we, the day we recorded the episode, I don't know if Dan remembers, 14 SPACs went public that day. Wow. Um, yeah, right. I, I have the tape of that. So we're going to get into that. Before we do, please take a minute. Check out the link you see on your screen, fool.com slash Frankel. Get the top 10 stocks to buy right now from The Motley Fool. It's the best way to support this work we're doing on YouTube. Again, fool.com slash Frankel. So, Dan, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the number of SPACs that went public in 2020 to 2022 was close to 1,000. Uh, there were a lot. A lot of these blank check companies were formed and some of them, there were so many and just so much money around that, you know, they were paying ridiculous valuations for businesses that probably should have never been public. Some companies were offering ridiculous valuations and still couldn't find anything to take public. A lot of blank check companies ended up liquidating uh, when the SPAC boom fizzled out. Um, two that I owned, I owned two of the Chamath Pali Apatia SPACs that, that ended up not doing anything. And getting $10 back on a $10 SPAC actually turned out to be the best return I could have hoped for. Um, so w without further ado, I want to talk about some of the lessons that we learned. Um, I know you and I, we were very selective on what we bought. And generally, when we bought one of the SPAC companies, it was a very small position. Um, but I'll, I'll start and we can talk about this. One of the biggest lessons that I learned is that a great product does not always make a great business. and one of the ones that, that immediately comes to mind that I put put money into was uh, 23andMe. It's still public, ticker symbols ME. Um, we all know them. They're the DNA tests. Uh, I, I did a DNA test. It didn't tell me any big surprises just because I, I know where I'm from. Um, I'm 100% I'm from the same place. Uh, but a lot of people who really find it interesting, and, and it, it gives you a lot of uh, interesting health information about what you're predisposed to and things like that. Uh, great product. They're the, they're the leader in, in genetics. So not a great business. It's wildly unprofitable. Their whole thesis is that they're going to take the, the information they get from people doing these DNA tests, which they lose money on, and use it to develop drugs uh, using genetic information that, you know, they partnered with uh, GlaxoSmithKline. So it's a legitimate business, but it's a money losing business. Um, there are a lot of other examples. Um, Dan, what, what, what's a SPAC that you invested in that you learned a lesson from? You know, I'd probably say that the, the, the thing that, that was the, probably the most interesting experience for me was Clover Health, uh, which is take our CLOV. That was one of the Chamath IPOs. It was, uh, and it's still out there. It, 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 it promised to revolutionize healthcare. They, they had kind of a good, a good business model that looked promising. And I think one thing that I learned from, in part from that, but also in part just from the whole suite of Chamath special purpose acquisition companies was just that even the best investors out there have only a limited number of really great ideas. And so when you have, you know, some of these companies, they would do, they would do one SPAC and that first SPAC looked really good and they found a good company for it and it worked out well and the launch worked out well. And so it tempted them into doing a second one. And then you kind of looked at the second one. The second one my, often wasn't quite as compelling as the first one had been. And, you know, certainly as, as 2020 gave way to 2021 then to 2022, the, the, the quality of the available companies, it, it really did go downhill, which I think is a big reason for the trajectory that we saw from that. But the interesting thing for me with Clover was just that there's a compelling story. Each one of these companies was able to, to spin a narrative that was extremely positive. And it was one that was quite convincing if you were predisposed towards liking it. And I think that in many ways, the SPAC structure predisposed an investor to like an idea because, as you pointed out, 
the way you got rewarded for these SPACs was when they made a deal. SPAC that didn't make a deal, you're getting your 10 bucks back, 10 bucks back out of 10. Yeah, sure. Compared to how some of these have turned out, it looks good in hindsight. But at the time, it was just sort of like a swing and a miss compared to watching some of these that found successful deals go up 2x, 3x, 5x. And so, you know, just 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 kind of watching that 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 story play out, the differences in the way that it played out compared to how the performance actually ended up. A lot of the things that Clover said that it wanted to do, it succeeded in doing. It just didn't necessarily have the same financial payoff that SPAC investors like me had hoped that it would. Yeah, and I mean, you you have to also realize that a lot of a lot of the SPACs that didn't do well probably would have done well had the zero interest environment continued, uh, had had money remained free, essentially a lot of these companies probably would have done well. The problem with a lot of them is they ran out of funding and couldn't get any more at any type of reasonable terms. I think Clover Health is one of those. Um, it, the, you're right. The projections that some of them were making were absolutely insane. Looking back, especially, um, I, there's there's one that made like these kind of claims that they were going to dominate the smart home technology uh, market. I'm, I can't even mention the company because it's too small now. Um, so... The structure of SPACs, most of them were heavily in favor of the sponsor. You said they were incentivized to find a deal, whether it was a good deal or bad deal. They essentially got 20% of the the shares of the SPAC for free uh, if they could find the deal. It was it was a very, very sweet uh, value for the sponsor, not always for the investor. I can name off the top of my head, I don't know if you can do better than me. I can name three SPACs off the top of my head that are higher than $10 right now. Um, one of them is DraftKings, which was before the SPAC boom happened. Um, that was a, you know, that was the SPAC being used for what it was intended for, not to take a company that should never be public public, just really to kind of make the process easier. Uh, so there's DraftKings, there's the the um, the Truth Social SPAC, DJT, um, but we won't get into that one. Uh, and then Sky Harbor, which I, I think you you and I both own that one. Ticker symbol is SKYH. It was actually a really good business that was taken public by Boston Omaha. Um, they were the sponsor of that one. And in my mind, that's the best management decision that they made over there at Boston Omaha was to find that one. They managed to find a great spec, and they did it at the peak of the of the bubble when there were you know 500 companies looking for deals. They found a, a solid business to take public. Um, so one of the biggest lessons I learned, I, I, I know Dan used to like, you know, pull his hair out just like I did when, when we would hear this phrase, if it's growing enough, valuation doesn't matter. I heard that all the time in 2021. It's growing at 70% per year. Who cares that it's trading at 50 times revenue or who cares that it's, not, it's barely generated? It, you know, it's a, a billion dollar company that made a million dollars in sales last quarter. Um, valuation matters a little bit even if no matter what the growth rate is that's a, a big lesson to learn you still have to take that into account even in a zero interest rate environment even if a company's growing like a weed it's it, you have to you have to pay attention to valuation i used to get so many eyes rolled at me when i brought up anything related to valuation uh back in the spac days and I, i'm sure you did too dan you're a value yeah. investor at heart like me um i don't know did you learn any at, from the, the companies I talked about, I know Sky Harbor is one that you own. Yeah. W what made that different? Like, wh why was that, a, you, not unique in a sense, but why was that different from all the ones that kind of fizzled out? Sky Harbor actually is unique for me because it's a Peter Lynch investment. I'm a, I'm a private pilot. And so I understand 100% Sky Harbor's business model. It's hard when you've got a plane, no matter what size it is, I've got a small single engine piston airplane. A lot of people have business jets. It's hard to find parking for those folks, especially at the big congested airports. And we saw in 2020 with the pandemic, a big rise in general aviation. Commercial airlines have, you know, the quality's deteriorated. The customer experience has just, you know, gotten to where a lot of people just don't want to fly commercial ever again. If you've got the money to fly private, then it is a good experience. That's what Sky Harbor's trying to, to get into. 
And so, you know, for me, as much as anything, I like the business. It's a speculative play by all means. It is, it's kind of like, you know, if you invest in, in pharmaceuticals or biotech companies and, and you buy a company that's still in preclinical trials, that's basically where Sky Harbor is in this business. They've got promising contracts, but it's going to be years before the assets are on the ground. I like a little bit of that in my portfolio. For the most part, I've got a lot of conservative investments. This was a good way to kind of go out on the risk spectrum with a small piece of my portfolio. And, and I like following it because of the aviation angle as well. But well, Sky Harbor has a, a durable competitive advantage is one of the reasons I like it that almost no SPACs had. Um, and their advantage, I mentioned a lot of SPACs were doing well because of the zero interest rate environment. Sky Harbor has almost permanent access to cheap capital because it can use uh, public revenue bonds. It, it uses municipal bonds to finance, so it has a, a clear financing advantage even when rates rise. Uh, I think its nearest debt comes due in, what, 35, 40 years. Um, it, it's a really unique financing structure. Uh, but we'll do another video on Sky Harbor another day. Dan, thanks for joining me. Leave me any questions you have. I'll do my best to get to each of them individually. I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. The Motley Fool is a company that provides investing insight and stock recommendations for investors of all skill sets and risk levels. You all know how much I love researching new stocks and trying to find the next best investment, so I'm proud to partner with The Motley Fool to bring you 10 stock picks from their popular product, Stock Advisor. Stock Advisor has beaten the market by more than four times, so go to fool.com slash frankel to get your 10 stock picks now. The Motley Fool Stock Advisor returns are 650% as of April 16th, 2024, and are measured against the S&P 500 returns of 148% as of April 16th, 2024.